Today's episode is sponsored by Golgotha, a historical murder mystery set in the First World War trenches and based around true events. When the rumour of a murdered soldier found crucified in no man's land sweeps the Allied trenches, it threatens an army-wide rebellion. One soldier from each nation's army is pulled from the ranks to join a team and investigate the crime. What they discover will change the course of the war. Golgotha is available at Odyssey Books or Amazon. And normally I narrate my visits to museums live, but after filming this episode, when I got home, I could hear that some parts were drowned out by the high winds outside, so please excuse me while I insert audio in certain places within this episode. I was also not so sure of some of my facts. I have a lot of stuff in my head. And so this allows me to correct a few of the small mistakes I made, or expand on some of the information I recorded originally. To celebrate this Anzac Day, we decided to visit one of our local military museums here in central Queensland. The Gladstone Maritime Museum sits at the base of Auckland Hill, and this gives you a fantastic panoramic view of the entire region of Gladstone. As for the Gladstone Maritime History Museum, well this was founded in 1988, and though not strictly speaking a military museum, it contains a lot of these sorts of objects and displays. This also includes HMAS Gladstone, a Fremantle class patrol boat that served the Royal Australian Navy during the 1980s, and we will be seeing that later. My suggestion is if you're going to visit this museum, you might want to check or contact them because they do have some limited hours. For example, the museum is only open between Friday and Sunday. And the guided tours of the HMAS Gladstone, these only run on the hour, and they do have very limited numbers on them because it is a quite small ship and they can't have too many people wandering through. So I suggest maybe if there's a, a way to book, you book. Otherwise, give them a call and make sure you get your space. So you can see, Quite a large museum, very well displayed. Because we're near the coast and at a port, there are obviously a lot of personal boating. And this does go through all the history, all the prizes and everything. Good display of all the shells that can be discovered in this area. And a lot of these are have been donated to the museum by various collectors that live in the area. So this is what we're talking about. This is North Queen or Central Queensland, I should say, up near Rockhampton. Rockhampton's up that way. Uh, they do have some quite decent. Because it's uh, lots of island and reefs and things. There have been a lot of shipwrecks here, so you can go through. Click on the shipwreck. So here we had the blue bill. Click on the blue bill. Built in 1876, a steamship it was on the way from Brisbane to Rockhampton. After the, or the other way around, after leaving Rockhampton, the Bluebell ran up on the South Keppel Rock. Soon became a total wreck. And so they do have pieces of a lot of these wrecks here. You can see some of the timbers here. And uh, I quite like this. Now this is a masthead. This was an American-made masthead from a ship that was actually found. Uh, let's just check here. Yeah, so it's found in a cave. That's what I thought. I was going to say that, but just had to check. Yeah, so this was actually found in a cave, the tidal cave. When the tide went out, they discovered this sitting inside the cave, and it's from a shipwreck from the Jenny, the Jenny Lynn. And here's an actual portrait of the lady that's depicted in a figurehead. So it's not very often that we get to know exactly who it was that was part of this figurehead. Yeah, that's very cool. And as we were saying, they've been finding lots of things here. I quite like these. These are clave pipes that were found along the, the coast and they've slowly turned to coral. Lots of ship now, obviously guys here were very interested in shipping and, and uh, lots of ship building and, and that includes the HMAS Canberra. Now this one got, got me quite excited. Now we are near the Coral Sea and the HMAS Canberra was the most famous victim of the, the Battle of the Coral Sea. So excuse the interruption, but I need to correct myself. This was not the Battle of the Coral Sea, but the Battle of Savo Island, and this occurred nearby, but some months later. This was one of the greatest Allied naval defeats of the war, and so it generally doesn't get the attention it deserves. For example, many people may not be aware that this is where Australia lost its flagship of the Royal Australian Navy, the HMAS Canberra. Her loss is often overshadowed by the loss of the far more famous HMA Sydney, but it was the Canberra that really struck home. A lot of people in Australia at the time were horrified to hear that they'd lost this ship. 
Now the Canberra, the HMAS Australia, and most of the other Royal Australian Navy large ships were not actually battleships. For example, the Australia and the Canberra, these were county class heavy cruisers. After the First World War, there was an international agreement that warships could only be built to a certain size to try and limit the insane dreadnought building that was happening before the war, especially between England and Germany. So Australia only bought the smaller cruisers, not the much larger battleships. Cruisers were fast, they were well armed, but they lacked the immense shielding that the larger warships could carry. But this also allowed them to cover vast distances with less need to refuel, and that made them perfect protecting the world's largest coastline. The Canberra was built in the UK and headed out to Australia in the 1920s. As Australia was a growing international representative in the Southern Hemisphere, the Canberra spent most of her earlier career sailing about in mostly ceremonial events. This would later cause serious problems during the war. While other Australian capital ships, like the HMAS Australia, were constantly being upgraded with armour and advanced weapon systems to keep them up to date, poor old Canberra was so busy sailing about representing Australia that she missed out on many of these upgrades. But with the start of the war, she was immediately called into front-line service. Now, to start with, most of the Australian capital ships, they were transporting troop transports from Australia across the world into places like Europe, into Africa, places like that. This left the Canberra in the Atlantic, and there she was actually used to find the pocket battleship Admiral Scheer, which was sailing around the Atlantic just looking to cause some trouble. Though the Canberra never met one of these German ships, there is evidence that Canberra heard rumours that the battleship had recently been resupplied, and so when two mysterious vessels appeared nearby, she was ready to go. The Canberra ordered the two ships to halt and be boarded, but they refused to answer. In fact, what they did was they separated and started to run. Now, a lot of Australian ships had fallen foul of disguised warships pretending to be merchantmen, so the Canberra actually took her time and she approached one of the ships very carefully. This was the Coburg, and she fired a shell to try and get it to stop. And when it refused, she actually started shelling the ship until it was completely crippled and dead in the water. While this was going on, the Canberra actually had a seaplane, which took off and was actually dogging the second ship, the Ketty Boving, and began dropping bombs to try and slow this German ship down. And in fact, the seaplane was so successful that the German crew began scuttling their ship to make sure that the Ketty didn't fall into their hands. It was actually the seaplane's crew that noticed this and landed. And actually, one of the crew members dove out of the ship across the shark patrolled waters to try and stop the German vessel from being scuttled. Unfortunately, the sailor failed. It was deemed that the ship had gone too far and it was going to be left, but he did manage to search the ship, discover some paperwork and charts, and then just waited for the Canberra to show up. Eventually, the cruiser did arrive, and with the big guns, she sank both German ships and then began picking up the German crew. Back and across the ocean she sailed, patrolling and protecting convoys, before then having to concentrate on Australia's northern waters as a new foe had invaded the islands there, the Japanese. Here the Canberra was eventually joined by US units like the USS Chicago, and all these ships were eventually tasked to help protect the marine attack on Guadalcanal. Here on the island it was believed that the enemy was creating runways, and this would prove a danger to Australia and its shipping, and so these had to be removed. On the night of the 8th of August, 1942, this Allied Navy was patrolling the waters off Guadalcanal when several enormous dark shapes sailed into these waters. Suddenly spotlights sprang to life and Japanese float planes flying overhead began dropping flares. All of these illuminated the Allied ships, which had been caught completely unprepared. The officers of the Canberra, however, sprang into action. They ordered the cruiser to top speed and to open fire at the Japanese warships. They even began dodging some of the torpedoes these Japanese vessels fired. Slowly, the Canberra's big gun swung about and took aim and that was the last action the flagship of the Royal Australian Navy would take. The Japanese fleet opened fire, the shells and torpedoes scoring major hits, including on the command deck, the boiler room, and the wardroom. This meant all the ship's officers and the men who could order repairs and take control of the ailing ship were gone. 24 hits in two minutes meant the Canberra was a burning wreck. Her power was gone, there was no one left to issue any orders, and now the entire ship seemed to be on fire. This is because the Canberra had not been squared away as it should have been. More ammunition than was needed to be stored on deck was hanging around, plus hammocks and various items were stowed all across the decks. All of this caught on fire. Also, due to her ceremonial status, very thick coats of paint were on everything because the ship was constantly repainted to make sure she always looked her best. Another problem, all the small boats that she carried, the lifeboats, the cutters, they were all stocked with fuel, and all of this was flammable. Possibly the worst thing was, Canberra also carried a float plane on her rear deck, and this was full of aviation fuel. 
with all these Japanese shells hitting the Canberra, the cruiser found itself on fire and the crew were fighting for their life. By the next day, 75 men were dead and over 109 were injured. There was also evidence, though this is denied by both sides, that the torpedo that really did a lot of the damage and destroyed the boilers actually came from the wrong side to where the Japanese were. This torpedo had actually been fired by the Americans, most likely the USS Bagley, and this had torpedoed the Canberra and it really caused most of the serious damage. The Japanese ships then they attacked the Chicago which managed to escape, then headed north to a second part of the Allied fleet uh, where there were more American cruisers and battleships and these were also taken mostly by surprise and many of them sunk. In fact, so many ships were sunk in this tiny little pit of ocean off Guadalcanal that is called Iron Bottom Sound. And though the US ships were sunk by the Japanese, I should mention the Canberra was not sunk by the Japanese. She was pretty much destroyed by the Japanese, but she survived. In fact, the Australian sailors who survived took great pleasure in the fact that it wasn't the Japanese who sunk the Canberra, it was actually the Allied themselves. When it was ascertained that she was far too damaged, there was no way of getting her running again. The damage to her engines and the boilers beyond repair, but her fires were actually giving their position away. It was decided the Canberra had to go and they actually tasked several of the US ships to sink her. 263 shells were fired at the Canberra, along with five more torpedoes. And it was the last torpedo that did the damage and eventually Canberra sunk to the item bottoms out. So it was actually the allies who sunk the Canberra not the Japanese. Now even though the Canberra was a great loss, there were lessons learned here. For example, her sister ship, the HMS Australia, began stripping all the paint off her decks and ensuring that nothing flammable was left. Now in a battle of tragedy upon tragedy, there is one more I should note. After the battle, there was an inquiry and most of the senior admirals that had been involved in this debacle were actually found free of any guilt. In fact, there was only one person who was going to get blamed and that was the captain of the US Chicago, Howard Douglas Bodle. For some bizarre reason, the Chicago, when it was originally attacked, it escaped, never said anything, never sent it a warning, never warned the other ships that were north of the attack, and so they were also caught unprepared. And it was for this action that Bode was going to be announced as the only person to shoulder any of the blame. And when he heard this, sadly, that night, he took out his pistol, shot himself in the head, and killed himself. Now this is not the only time Chicago was really evolved in a friendly fire incident, by the way. Uh, Chicago was actually in Sydney Harbour when it was attacked by the Japanese midget submarine fleet. As the largest ship at dock, it was the Chicago that they're after, possibly also the Canberra. And when it was clear the attack was underway, Chicago actually opened fire at the harbour around her. However, it should be noted that Chicago shells firing across the harbour's waters didn't actually penetrate the water, they ricocheted off the water into the surrounding city. And here they caused a quite a bit of damage, but they actually didn't kill anyone. Now there is a legend. That is, the Americans were looking for submarines firing away. They spotted the conning tower of a submarine and opened fire. Sadly, this submarine turned out to be not a submarine, but the Australian fortress that sits in the middle of the harbour, Fort Denison. And even today, you can see some of the damage that was a result of the friendly fire from the USS Chicago. There were also other ramifications of the loss of Canberra. The British felt so bad, they actually offered the HMS Shropshire as a replacement. The Americans, however, did something else. They had a new warship about to come online and they actually named it the USS Canberra. And this is the only time this has happened that a US ship is actually named after a foreign city. That's it, so they've got lots of sea stuff from the, the Royal Navy. And that's because, and you'll see later, uh, they've actually got a warship here that's been uh, part of the museum and you get to go through that. They're actually waiting for me to go on our little tourist in a minute, so I better hurry up. Um, but yeah, oh, there's lots of things to see here. I love this. This is a 300 million, uh, 300 million, I do too many dinosaurs. 300 year old samurai sword. And this is one of the, the uh, trophies brought back from the Royal Navy during the Second World War. And this was actually brought back from the HMAS Gladstone. And we are in Gladstone. So, pretty important ship. I have no idea what the HMAS Nizam is, but now that I've done that, I will look it up later. You might hear an audio insert here. So what was the HMAS Nizam? Well, it was a destroyer, and it was a warship that actually fought throughout the entire Second World War. She fought across the world. She fought in the Atlantic, in the Mediterranean, and in the Pacific. In fact, the Nizam was part of the infamous Tobruk Ferry Service, 
Now these were Allied ships that ran the gauntlet of the Axis forces that were slowly strangling the Australian-British forces trapped within Tobruk in North Africa. The most famous of these was the Scrap Iron Flotilla, and these were a series of old World War I destroyers that had been sold to Australia, and these were the first to begin their supply run in Tobruk. It was actually the Germans who heard about this and were mocking the Australian ships, calling them the Scrap Iron Flotilla, as they expected them to very easily be destroyed and sent to the bottom of the sea. It should be pointed out, most of them eventually did end up being sunk, but quite a few of them did survive to the end. But the Nizam was not one of these, it was actually a much more modern ship. Now there are reports that when the Nizam returned to the Pacific, she was actually working in the north and she received order that the war was over and that she was to cease fire. Minutes later after receiving this order, she was then attacked by a Japanese warplane, I think officially making her one of the few ships to be attacked after the war had ended. And her last test makes the Nizam actually quite an important ship. She was chosen to be one of the representatives of the British Pacific Fleet, so she was tasked to sail to Tokyo Bay at the war's end, and she was actually patrolling Tokyo Bay to help ensure peace when the Japanese formally signed their surrender terms on board the USS Missouri. As to what the HMAS Nizan is, and if there wasn't something here, then I obviously couldn't find out much or I'd forgotten. But one of the things I really like is this part of the coast. Uh, this was where obviously Captain Cook sailed along, but most importantly, here we have Matthew Flinders. Now Matthew Flinders sailed along this part. We can actually see his map up here. Flinders was very important. He was sailing the Australian coastline, although at that time it was, of course, uh, not Van Diemen's land. Yes, it was New Holland. And here we have the HMS Instigate Investigator. This was his ship. Now, he was realizing that there was the very shallow reefs and systems along here, so he needed another ship. So he also started sailing with the Lady Nelson. Now, I was lucky enough to actually sail on the Lady Nelson. She's currently down at Tasmania in Hobart and you can do dial trips, uh, day trips, and I might insert a bit of footage here. So yes, I have definitely sailed on the Lady Nelson, but I should point out the vessel sailing out of Hobart is most certainly a replica. It would turn out that the early years of the Botany Bay colony, that they had no vessels capable of sailing home. The few that they had had either left or had been shipwrecked. Now back in England, there was a new vessel being built, the Lady Nelson. Now I should point out, at this exact time, there are actually several different vessels called the Lady Nelson. And for a historian, this can actually cause a lot of confusion, so you need to know which Lady Nelson you're talking about. This Lady Nelson, once she was finished, the Admiralty agreed with those commanding Botany Bay, and the Lady Nelson was tasked to sail to Botany Bay to uh, take up station in the new colonies. So eventually the Lady Nelson arrived and she began helping to survey the continent. And she did eventually join Flinders, because the smaller Lady Nelson could actually enter shallower waters than the investigator. And this became very important as he slowly mapped the continent. In fact, she spent decades sailing around Australia, helping to establish new colonies, and then also helping to supply these colonies. And that's where the Lady Nelson got into trouble. Finally, she had to sail to Malaysia for supplies. Then this turned out to be one trip too many, as here she fell under the guns of Malay pirates, and everyone on board was killed. As for the replica Lady Nelson, this was built in 1988, the actual bicentenary of Australia. And she has sailed about Southern Australia many times. In fact, taken in part of many tall ship races and things like that. So she's a busy ship and she's currently available for day trips around Hobart. And that's what I eventually got to do. And it was amazing to sail on, on this sail ship based on this ancient ship. So here's the man himself. And he's the man who mapped half of Australia. A lot of people say he mapped Australia. He didn't actually map Australia. He mapped half of Australia. Halfway along, uh, just off South Australia, he bumped into a French guy called Bourdain and they met at a place called Encounter Bay, which is still called Encounter Bay today, and they swapped maps. So why, why finish the rest of the map? This guy's already done the other half. They swapped maps, and he was the guy who then took that map to both halves, created the first map of Australia, and named Australia. He's the guy who created the name of Australia. As I said before that, it was um, New Holland. But yeah, so as you can see, there's quite a, you know, if you ever get to Gladstone, there's lots of cool stuff to see here. Well, we should point out, with their shipbuilding, these are obviously a lot of the ships that plied this area. And here we have the HMB Endeavour, not the HMS Endeavour, the HMB Endeavour. Her Majesty's Bark Endeavour. And next to it, one of the more famous ships that sailed in this area. Mutiny on the Bounty, here's the HMS Bounty. Yeah. So there we go, and there is the HMS Gladstone, which 
uh, we're about to go on. We're, we've got a guided tour, as I said, they're waiting for us over there. So I better finish up. We're going to go in and have a look through this ship. So we'll talk later. So thanks for listening to our episode today. And remember, this was sponsored by Golgotha, my historical murder mystery set in the First World War trenches. And if you like murder mysteries, if you like a bit of tongue-in-cheek humour, then this is only the book for you. Otherwise, I hope you'll stay around for our next video.